This episode and others like it are made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. We just did a major overhaul of our patrons-only Discord server, so if you'd like to join our growing community and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash secondthought. Gamers rejoice! This week we're talking about someone even more obsessed with feet than you are. Fossil Fuel Companies if you're living and breathing and watching this video, you've definitely heard of a carbon footprint before. Maybe you've even taken one of the many, many tests out there to calculate what your disgusting, unseemly, selfish carbon footprint is. Each one is like a little pollution BuzzFeed quiz, but one that makes you feel even worse than when you didn't get Chandler even after trying three times. Really? But, but my favorite bird is Big Bird, surely that means something. Anyway, we're all pretty familiar with the words carbon footprint. Say it with me. A carbon footprint is a measure of the total amount of carbon dioxide, CO2, and methane, CH4, emissions of a defined population, system, or activity, considering all relevant sources, sinks, and storage within the spatial and temporal boundary of the population, system, or activity of interest. Calculated as carbon dioxide equivalent using the relevant 100-year global warming potential, GWP100. Hey, good job! See, I knew you knew it. Okay, so even without the exact definition, most of us have easily assimilated the general idea that the things we consume produce carbon emissions, and that carbon emissions are bad because, well... That idea, that emissions are mostly a product of what we produce and consume, is the basic idea behind any kind of carbon footprint at the end of the day, and it's pretty much common sense. But there's a lot more to this measure than meets the eye. And hidden beneath what could have been a positive idea are very nefarious intentions and some pretty damaging consequences when it comes to climate change. Because even though finding ways to reduce your personal impact on greenhouse gas emissions can be a good thing, that's not what the term carbon footprint is there to do. To understand what's going on, we should talk a bit more about the origin of this phrase. Boom, look at that, you just got video essayed and you didn't even notice. That's why I make the big bucks. Carbon footprint comes from the more general ecological footprint, a term coined in the 90s by these guys in this report, which eventually became this book. In this book, the two academics start off with a truly horrific, stomach-churning analogy about a wasp that gives birth in a mushroom, and then casually follow it up with around 150 pages of standard environmental economics, using the idea of an ecological footprint to talk about how production and consumption are dependent on various uses of resources namely fossil fuels. Thrilling stuff. The thing is that, on its own, this book is fine. Not without room for criticism, plenty of that to go around, but mostly pretty uncontroversial stuff about how the environment is important, humans are important, and we can't keep extracting and polluting this much and also expect economic growth forever and ever until the end of time. There are even some neat little sentences about how free enterprise and free trade are not only some of the root causes of the environmental crisis we're in today, but relying on them or the imaginary eco-modernist capitalist tech utopia as a solution won't actually help us. Pause the video if you want to read the original text, nerds. The rest of us will be moving on. So if this book is mostly uncontroversial, and its use of the phrase ecological footprint is fine, why make a 15-minute video about carbon footprints? Well, because the only reason we even know what a carbon footprint is, is thanks to a massive appropriation of the term by BP, British Petroleum, and their 2005 advertising campaign. You might know BP from their shocking lack of a fun facts section on Wikipedia. Or maybe you know them from this ad, in which they took the bright-eyed ecological footprint stepping off the bus in the big city and turned it into the red carpet attending, gala hosting, movie star carbon footprint we all know and love. Take a look. How much carbon I produce? Is that it? You mean the effect that m my living has on the earth in terms of the products I consume? Around the same time this ad ran, BP also launched its very own carbon footprint calculator online, getting over a million website visitors and around 300,000 people to do the survey, back when those weren't tiny little internet numbers. These two projects cemented the term in popular culture and made it what it is today. At first glance, and to much of the consumer market, this was a revolutionary ad campaign and a shocking stance from one of the world's largest producers of fossil fuels. You have to understand that this was not how the oil business was done. 
when in the 1970s, Exxon conducted private research on greenhouse gas emissions and found mountains of evidence of their central impact on global warming, they didn't tell anybody. It took another decade or so before public researchers caught on. And even once it was all out in the public, Exxon and all their buddies spent hefty sums on misinformation, disinformation, lobbying, and round-the-clock advertising questioning the reality of climate change, which they had known for years was a fact of greenhouse gas emissions, in order to stall policies that would try to rein them in. Fossil fuel executives took all the lessons they learned from your college boyfriend and gaslit the hell out of the American public. When this campaign first started, you could look around and see bold ad slogans promoted by the fossil fuel sector like, how much are you willing to pay to solve a problem that may not exist? Or the knee slapping, who told you the earth was warming? Chicken little? You can imagine that in that kind of context, an ad that explicitly states the reality of climate change coming from one of the industries it is most closely associated with was unheard of. But you're not dumb. You already know why they did it. There was no legitimate concern about the global environment, not from one of the companies that stands to profit off of it the most. It was all about shifting the blame from them to you. BP popularized the term carbon footprint so heavily, not because they wanted to balance their emissions checkbook after cashing in on decades worth of oil money, but because they wanted to keep doing it and get you off their backs about it. They wanted to make it your problem. Because when you start thinking it's all your fault, and that solving climate change depends exclusively on your decisions as an individual, your relationship to fossil fuel usage and other commodities is narrowed down to a single identity, that of a consumer. As a consumer, your responsibility is strictly limited to making better individual decisions. Structural change is beyond your purview. Turning off the lights, shorter showers, products with little green stickers, that is the extent of your involvement in the fight against climate change. In that framework, oil companies are just middlemen between you and the thing you want. If you just didn't want it, they wouldn't be there. It's so simple, and there's nothing wrong with that argument. But there is the opposite of nothing wrong with that. There's a whole lot wrong with that, actually. You're not just a consumer. And even if you were, you don't make decisions in a vacuum. For starters, it would be impossible for you to simply make better decisions and reduce your carbon footprint so meaningfully that it would quote-unquote solve climate change on its own. Even if there are things that are technically up to you, some of those choices you have you just can't reasonably be expected to make. Take cars, for example. You'll often hear things about how emissions from transportation are one of the biggest sources of emissions. And while that's true, though pretty insidious depending on how you calculate it, in a country entirely designed around car use, with little to no public transportation, not driving a car makes very little sense for most Americans. Biking, taking the subway, or walking are only options in very few places and for very few people. There is a structural barrier to lowering your car usage that makes that type of consumer decision nearly impossible for most people and incredibly difficult for the remainder. Now, you could switch to electric when your car is near the end of its life, which would reduce your carbon footprint in the long run. But there are structural accessibility issues there too, both in terms of cost and in the lack of charging stations that would make this solution necessarily not apply to most people. Also, Elon Musk is a dweeb and his cars thirst for blood. And of course, even if switching to electric means moving away from fossil fuels as a direct store of energy, your source of electricity will probably still be fossil fuel powered, and the electric car trade-off includes implicating more rare earth metals into your car's production. Once again, your limitations as a consumer mean that things outside your control get in the way of even the best intentions. Some things are baked into your lifestyle and are impossible to let go of while still functioning in human society. Most people's survival in countries from the imperial core is dominated by the consumption of commodities, many of them highly polluting, and there are a lot of structural factors that make that lifestyle nearly impossible to extricate yourself from or even just reduce. Your choices are so heavily constrained and centered around consumption that making better decisions in that kind of environment usually boils down to spending money on the lesser evil some of the time. That is, if you can even afford to make the most environmentally conscious choice. And assuming that choice even amounts to anything in a world where products are endlessly repackaged and greenwashed to trick you. 
Sometimes, the products you can choose from can even be limited by the influence of vested interests, the way that large fossil fuel companies use their incomparable wealth to shut down and slow the growth of electric car projects. If you want to go another layer deep, consider that every product you will ever buy in a store is only there because it is profitable, weeding out way more often than not those products that can't easily exploit labor and natural resources during the production process, and meaning that they will usually have a negative effect on some natural resources because it is infinitely more profitable to pollute than to be sustainable. The bottom line is that if we stay rigidly within the logic of carbon footprints, there are serious limits on what we can do to limit the effects of climate change, which means our decisions will have minimal impact. Think back to the part of the pandemic we called the height of the pandemic, when millions of people were locked in place and we saw a dramatic drop in the use of airplanes and cars. Our carbon emissions dropped less than 10% that year and shot right back up in 2021. Without structural change, even massive individual action, involuntary though that instance was, does not change the course on which we are set when we cannot adapt our normal routine away from this amount of pollution at a societal level. That's not to say that you shouldn't make the more climate-friendly choice if you can, by the way. For some people, there will be decisions around consumption that can and should be made when keeping environmentalism in mind. You should buy the more sustainable product if you can, and if you are going to buy that kind of product anyway. As an added note, there is some scientific evidence that people who consume more consciously are more likely to take that attitude into more substantial, collective political action. But do not stop at consumption. Individual decisions like these aren't solutions. They're little more than harm reduction. They do not challenge the direction the arrow is pointing. Solutions, the actual sources of change, aren't found in individualism. They're found in collective action. The fact that sustainable consumption and minding your carbon footprint are presented as a solution is nothing more than a rhetorical trick that maintains the system of profitable pollution in place. All right, get ready, because you're about to get hit with a big long quote from Matt Huber in his article, Ecological Politics for the Working Class, to summarize what we've been talking about thus far. The idea of an ecological footprint construes the power equation in reverse order. By making consumers wholly responsible for their consumptive impact, this perspective ignores the critical role of capital, which constrains both the kind and the quantity of goods that are thrown into the market. The gasoline in your tank flowed through the hands of innumerable people seeking profit. Oil exploration technology consultants, production companies, rig service firms, pipeline companies, gas station operators. Yet you are the one responsible for the footprint simply because you pressed the gas leading to the emissions? When it comes to consumption, every commodity has users and profiteers along the chain. We should place the bulk of responsibility on those profiting from production, not simply people fulfilling their needs. This is not a moral calculus as much as an objective assessment of who has the power along these commodity chains. Of course, we don't want to completely ignore the responsibility of those few wealthy consumers who buy fuel in efficient cars, eat steak twice a week, and fly excessively. But why do we only focus on their consumption as the proper zone of responsibility and politics? Lil Matty Hubes is right. When we recognize that the real decision-making power is in the hands of people who stand to profit from fossil fuel extraction, we can see that the solution isn't desperately and inefficiently signaling to them with our purchases what we want, but actually seizing that power of decision-making ourselves. We should get to decide what resources we want, in what amounts, and how best to approach acquiring them, not letting whatever makes the most money govern which way our lives go. The answer, so to speak, is then to reconceptualize what environmental action is. It's about centering it around solidarity and collective action, not individual choices since they often frame the burden of being better on people who are already struggling to satisfy their basic needs. It's understanding that to resolve issues of climate change, we can't simply urge people to consume less. We need to guarantee the security of their access to the things they truly need and decommodify, in other words, remove from market pressures, the resources which we know are creating profit around pollution. It's shifting the power of decision-making about what we do regarding stuff that pollutes away from fossil fuel companies and their deceptive ad agencies and into our hands, unobstructed from the naturally perverting effects of voting with your dollar schemes that will always just bolster whichever industry had the most money to start off with. 
Plans like the Green New Deal, which attach environmentalism to a jobs guarantee, to healthcare, to the transition away from fossil fuels and towards renewable sources of energy, do this kind of stuff, though admittedly still within a social democratic framework. As much as possible, we need to make sure that the Green New Deal and other ways to reassert our collective power over our common future are going to be the way forward. It's time to stop taking the bait on corporate schemes like the individual carbon footprint. There is nothing we can achieve alone that wouldn't be better together. We need collective action. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that this kind of content is made possible by my patrons on Patreon. As you can probably imagine, when I made the switch to producing political content, I started getting demonetized way more often, and most of my sponsors bailed. It's understandable, but because of this, I'm having to rely more heavily on viewers like you. If you like the kind of videos I'm producing, and you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate the support. As a little show of that appreciation, every patron, regardless of donation amount, gets early access to every video, plus access to our patrons-only Discord server. We actually just dropped a major update to the Discord, and there are some really cool new features. We've got everything from a recommended reading list, to a book club, to special channels for our neurodivergent and LGBT comrades. We also have fun medal rolls for people who complete the server challenges. We've built a great little community, and we'd love for you to be a part of it. So if you'd like to help support my channel, join the Discord, and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash secondthought. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my previous videos by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.